of the four or five part series for first time home buyers. If you haven't already, jump back and watch part one. That's getting ready to start the process where you talk about some of the things that you want to do to get started with becoming a first time buyer. Or maybe you've bought a home before when it was years ago and you've forgotten and this is a refresher. So maybe instead of saying first time home buyer, we just say, relatively new home buyer. How about that? Well, we're going to be in part two here, and this is where we're going to talk about the qualifying process. In the old days, we had a joke, or joke may not be the right word. There were some things that we would say that would talk about what it takes to obtain credit. In this particular case, the credit we're talking about is the ability to purchase a home. So you're getting a loan, you're, you're gaining credit for buying that new home. A cute way to remember it was we used to call it the three C's, and that was capacity, collateral, and credit. Okay, let's talk about collateral and credit real quickly. Collateral, that's the property that you are thinking about buying. What are you going to put up as collateral as um, uh, something that helps you with your promise to repay. And in this case, the answer to that is the home that you're purchasing. That would be the collateral that you're looking at. Credit is self-explanatory. Again, one of the things that we look at in determining if we can do this loan for you is what your credit looks like. Have you proven in the past that you have the propensity to pay your bills when they're due? Have you been smart with your money? Have you shown that you've got some financial literacy in your background? Those are important, but capacity is the one that we're going to talk about a lot right here in the qualifying process. Capacity is many things. Do you have the ability to handle this debt that you're about to undertake? You might want to, you might hope you can, um, the, the house may be the greatest house ever, and you may have perfect credit. By the way, there's no such thing as a perfect credit score. We'll talk about that later. You may have all of those things, but if you don't have the capacity, if you don't have the ability to take care of this debt, then we have a problem. So when we're talking about capacity. One of the things we're going to look at is your income figuring out your income. The next thing is going to be knowing about your debts. What are your debts? And the last thing, what are your assets? What are the things that you bring to the table that will strengthen your loan application and uh, better document your ability to pay this debt back? So let's talk about income really quickly. We're not going to go deep into the weeds here because we could go on and on and on and on. But for income, if you will think of it from an underwriter's perspective for just a moment, and it's the only time I'm going to ask you to do this, but think about it as if you were an underwriter. What we are looking for is documented income and verification that the income is stable. Stability is something that we're looking for. If last month you got the best, the biggest and best check that you've ever earned and it was because you had 15 hours of overtime, your check looks great. And if we multiply that out across the, the path of a year, whether you're paid weekly or two weeks or monthly or whatever, if we multiply it out, it'll make it look like you make a whole lot of money. But is it stable? Do you earn that amount every single pay period? And if the answer is no, the likelihood is we're not going to pass the stability test in looking at that big number. And we may have to look at a smaller number as a piece of that. In other words, we need to see some historical perspective on your income. How long have you earned that income? Has it been stable? Does it fluctuate up and down? And that's not a bad thing as long as we can document even that fluctuation has some stability in it. Maybe you're a commission employee, maybe you get large year-end bonuses or things like that. Those are things that we have to look at. But remember, any income that you want to count, overtime income, bonus income, commission income, we just have to document that it's stable. One of the ways that we document that stability is looking backwards, for two years. So if you have any unique income feature 
overtime bonus. Uh, if you're a nurse, shift differential, commissions, um, any of those things, or even if you're a regular employee but you're paid hourly, we're going to want to look backwards for a two-year history of the stability of that income. We'll, we'll talk about some of those things later, but that's part of what goes into it. Are you self-employed? If you're self-employed, remember that two-year stability situation. We're going to have to see documented that this level of income has been sustained for the previous two years. And the way we do that is two years tax returns. We'll come back to that again. Again, at this point, this is just an early dive on knowing what your income is. But that's the first thing we have to do is calculate your income. Some people are paid monthly. Some people are paid semi-monthly, like the 15th and the 30th or something like that. Some people are paid every other Friday. That's not semi-monthly, that's bi-weekly. Some people are paid weekly, we get that. All of those things are things that we have to know in helping to determine what your actual income is. Knowing your debts, I think that's pretty simple. That's fairly self-explanatory. We wanna see your debts. They will manifest themselves on the credit report that we're looking at in most cases. You are required to disclose to us if there is a debt that you know about that isn't on the credit report. It is incumbent upon you to share that information with us, but we'll talk about that. So we want to know what your debts are. One of the things that we run into, especially with first time buyers, is this issue with student loans, especially coming out of the last three years with COVID and the things that we've been dealing with. A lot of student loans have been in deferral or in forbearance. Therefore, there's been no monthly payment obligation attached. Well, we have to pretend as if there was one, and we do have to calculate what a uh, projected monthly debt is going to be if there isn't one noted on the credit report. We can talk about that later as well. We have a system in place for how we, would, you know, how we can do that. There's even things if you meet with us far enough in advance, maybe you've got a lot of student loan debt. Well, there's things you can do to mitigate that. You can consolidate those debts. You can apply to go on an income-based repayment plan for those student loans, and that might, you know, that might cut your student loan monthly payments in, in half in helping you to qualify. Lastly, know your assets. The reason I say know your assets is because I can tell you stories of times where we have had for some buyers come in, and I will, I will admit, they're first-time home buyers, and a lot of time, first-time home buyers, they don't know the underwriting rules. You don't know that that underwriter is going to open up your bank account and start looking at things that you didn't realize even mattered, and there's things that we pay attention to. So, know your assets. We're going to look at your bank statements. Most specifically, we're going to look at the last two months' bank statements. If there are large deposits in those bank statements, they must be documented and they must come from an acceptable source. One of the things I will tell you, and this is one of the best things you can do for yourself, if you think home buying is in your future, near future, do not move money back and forth between accounts. Even if you think you're doing it for the right reasons, because if you've ever seen one of those game shows where they play the shell game and they have three shells and they put a ball under the shell and they start moving the shells around at the end, you're supposed to know where the ball is. It, it can become a shell game if you have money in a checking account and move it to a savings account or you have money in a checking account in a different bank and you move it to the checking account in the first bank while at the same time moving money from the first checking account to the second checking account. It, it, is okay and it can be documented but it triple or quadruples the amount of work that you have to do to document because we have to source every deposit that goes into your account back to its origin and if you've been moving money back and forth it it may force us to go two three four five months backwards looking at bank statements seeing the money so the best advice i can give you is Put the money in one account, or if it's auto-deposited, let it go into that account and let it stay there, at least during the time that you're preparing to buy a home. 
I'm not telling you to do that forever, but in that two to three month period immediately preceding wanting to buy a house, let's not move money around. Cash, I know that, that this is gonna sound weird, but cash is a very difficult item to document. Therefore, we really don't wanna see cash deposits that go in, and when we see it, we'll see a deposit and we say, hey, what was that? And you may say, it was cash. I'm not telling you that we won't be able to use it. I'm telling you that the threshold for being able to use it is substantially higher than if it was a regular deposit or a check deposit or an auto deposit or a wire or an ACH or something like that. If those things are gonna happen, if you have cash under the mattress at your house, put it in the bank now. And then three months from now, when you're ready to start the process, when we ask for two months bank statements, the money was just in your account. And we don't have to worry about going back and discovering whether it was cash and things like that. Gifts from family members, they're okay in most cases, but we need to know about it in advance because there are some loan programs that unilaterally allow gifts. There are some programs that allow some gift, but not all. And then there are some programs that don't allow it at all. Again, we can help you, we just have to know in advance. So if some of your down payment or closing cost or money that you're going to spend on this transaction is going to come from a gift, tell us in advance. Who is it coming from? When are you gonna get it? How much will it be? So that we can make sure that we put you in the right, right loan program or do it now and then the same thing with the cash, three months from now, the money's in your account and it's not questioned and there's no problem with it. So that's assets. Again, we're going to dig a little bit deeper in these things in some later videos that we're talking about. We're gonna calculate your income. We're going to verify your debts. We wanna know what your assets are. Those are things that you need to have with you when you're ready to meet with that mortgage professional so that we can help put you in the most advantageous position for yourself. I say all the time, I believe I said it in the opening video, knowledge is power. The more information I can get to you, the sooner in the process, the better educated you are, the better decisions you'll make through the process. That's our goal. I hope you've liked part two to the video series. I wish you would hit that subscribe button. We grow the traffic on this channel by people like yourselves looking at this video and liking the video and subscribing to the channel and sharing this information with your friends and coworkers and colleagues that might also be looking for a home. Hit that subscribe button for me. Thank you for watching The Mortgage Farmer. Come on back when we hit the third in this four or five part series where we're gonna actually talk about the loan process itself. Thanks again for watching The Mortgage Farmer.